It is really a pleasure to have Irwin here. Uh, people, sometimes you hear the trite phrase, a man who needs no introduction. I won't say that. This is actually a man who any of you could introduce because his accomplishments and his fame are so well known. Irwin is the global chairman and CEO of Group M, the biggest media planning and buying agency in the world part of WPP, and I would add the most profitable part of WPP. He is on any list considered to be the most influential person in the advertising and marketing business. He pioneered the use of data in media buying decisions. I would argue, and you'll get a chance to see whether you agree, that you really were instrumental in transforming this from an art into a science, where people were sometimes going by the seat of their pants and their instincts and giving them data. Not sure that was such a good thing well, in retrospect, but. <laughs> and, well, we'll come to that then. And also transform the media agency, separating out the creative process from the buying and planning process. He's had a fascinating life, born in Dalian, China, grew up in Japan, speaks fluent Japanese. Some of the most fun times I've had with Irwin have been going into Japanese restaurants. Well, he will not sit down until he's interviewed the chef in Japanese to make sure that the sushi is properly prepared. And you've never had sushi, and I mean that, until you've had it with Irwin. He's won just about every award, pioneering, legend, hall of fame, Jeff, we only have 45 oh, minutes. All right. All right. <laughs> then, then I'll summarize all that. Group M is a smart organization, and Irwin is the giant brain that sits at the top of the organization. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you for driving all the way up from uh, Los Angeles to be here. And fortunately, it's a beautiful day. So let's start. I want to ask you some questions, and then we're going to let the audience ask some questions. Okay. So I, was, I would argue that if you, you're a long way from retirement, and I suspect you will never retire. But if you went into the advertising business in 1950, and you retired in 1995, I think you would have had a fascinating career. But it was fundamentally the same business in 1995 that it was in 1950. If you went in five or 10 years ago, it's unrecognizable today. I'm re your career has, scanned, has spanned both parts of that. What do you see as the major changes? So I think there was, <clears throat> uh, I will disagree just a little bit with a comment that the business as it existed in 1950 still existed in 1995, um, primarily because of the comment you made earlier about the shift from being a pure art play to becoming a data and technology play, right? Um, the Martin, my boss, uh, says it's the shift from madmen to mathmen. And that began to happen right in the early 70s, about the time I got into the business. I mean, I remember the first time. Uh, my boss pitched a television show to a client because in those days you took sponsorship positions. He talked about the script, he talked about character development, never brought up rating estimates or CPMs, just wasn't part of the jargon, right? Three years later it was. I may have had a little bit to do with it, but I wasn't the only cause. Um, and I think, I think the biggest difference between 1950 and 1995 was the tilt to accountability, the tilt towards analytics and insights and all of that stuff away from a pure creative process. I assume that changed the kind of people you brought into the agencies, the kinds of skills you needed, <clears throat> where you found those people. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I had a guy in 1972, one of the legends of the business uh, at the time, um, he interviewed me, and his question to me was, what's the square root of 300? Okay. How many of you can answer that quickly? What is it? Yeah. What's the square 
No, 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 but what is the, what's the value? Okay, so what, what he was looking for was, could you do 12 times 12 equals 144, 13 times 13, at blah, 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 and so on, and get to a number, an approximate number. And if you took a while to get to it, he'd understand one thing. But if you'd studied math in those days, because we didn't have calculators, we had slide rules, right? Everybody needed to know the square root of two and three and four and so on. And the square root of 300 is 10 times the square root of three. So when he asked me the question, I said, you know, 17.32. It didn't take me very long. I didn't have to go through the rigmarole. And uh, he smiled, and I got the job, but it was a good thing. Uh, but there was a shift that was occurring even then. And in fact, the skill sets have had to change. So is, and you work so, most of what you were doing in the 70s was television. Was there room, and at that time, there were the legendary schedules, people like Fred Silverman, Brandon Tartikoff, who I don't think could have told you the square root of 300, but understood, had good instincts as to what people would watch and what they would like. Is there still room for those kinds of people in the business? You know, let me put it this way. I've always thought of what we do. I mean, today we get into regression analytics, we get into much heavier stuff. But for the most part, all you need is a really strong facility with eighth grade math. You don't need much more than that. And what people like Fred Silverman and Brandon Tartikoff could do is they could go through pages of Nielsen data and extract the relationships and understand them and interpret them. That's incredibly mathematical. Now, these were also brilliant creative minds, but Fred was known much more for scheduling expertise, as was Brandon, actually, right? These guys, these guys could do math. So where would you put Netflix and Reed Hoffman? With, and, the, and the legend, and it says, is that they decided to create House of Cards not because they, had, they thought it was a great script, but because their rental data showed the British House of Cards was being rented, how popular uh, Kevin Spacey was. Is that what it's becoming? Is what used to be done by, by programmers and schedulers turning into data science? I think programmers and schedulers were always data scientists. They just didn't have data at a gra as a granular level as they do today. But it was always about data science. I don't think that's changed. I really don't. So, on, so now you're really running a data company. WPP has become an enormous data company. You just bought a new company in the last two weeks, Essence. And what's your thinking there? What were you looking for? What did you not have at Group M that Essence is bringing into the equation? Okay, so some of you know that uh, our relationship with Google has been, um, I wouldn't say adversarial, but we're the ones who began to refer to them as the frenemy, right? I always wondered when we were gonna see the friend part of that equation, but. Me too, me too. Um, but the truth of the matter is, we spend, at WPP, we spend $3 billion a year with Google, right? And that number's growing. We, we have a responsibility to spend that money with as much precision as we spend every other dollar on behalf of our clients. Uh, we have never used the Google tech stack. We have always built our own technology, had our own data sources. We believe we should always be using data that comes from other sources rather than the vendor. And we've invested a massive amount of money to accomplish that objective. But in essence, we have a capability that is absolutely world-class on the Google tech stack. 
And so we will be more and more over time using the essence approach, um, the essence best in class use of the Google tech stack in our deployment of dollars on Google itself. So I always thought you were being diplomatic when you referred to them as a frenemy because they really look more, I think, like an avowed enemy who wanted to see the media agencies go away. What's changed in the 10 years? Is it now peaceful coexistence? Has it moved into cooperation? Or do they still want to see you go away? Um, I don't know. I don't know that they actually have thought about it all that much. The, the truth of the matter is they have a market capitalization that's significantly higher than ours. They have valuation metrics that favor them. And so they have a scale, just a pure market cap scale, that gives them an M&A M an advantage. And they have uh, valuation metrics that allow them to do things that would be quite challenging for us to do. We continue to be measured on profitability and margins. And uh, they can do something that to us would be massively margin dilutive and still have no impact, right? Um, I mean, if you, notice, if you go back years, Google acquired YouTube for one and a half billion dollars. And two days later, their market cap rose by $3 billion. It's a nice position to be in. Yeah. Right? Although, I'm, I am, quite frankly, a bit envious. Although, although we were talking yesterday, it's sort of odd. They paid $1.5 billion, which they could take out of the spare change in their pocket. And yet it still bothers them. They've never made money off of that. And they're still trying really to. Yeah, but at least they can do that, they right? Can, they can if do we that. had done that, the financial markets would have castrated us. So that's Google. Where's Facebook in this equation? Where's Facebook and WPP and Group M? M more of a friend, more of an enemy, or also a frenemy? It's a challenging relationship because, I mean, there are fundamental issues that we have. Do they want to put you out of business? I don't think they want to put us out of a business. They want to be able to massively overstate the views that they have because they use a two-second definition of a view, which is a bit of a joke, right? I mean, the, the most fundamental thing that a media guy or a media operation needs to do is apples-to-apples apples comparisons. Well, a two-second view versus a 30-second view are not the same thing. And uh, there, there are issues like that. But I think the fundamental thing that, that troubles us. Um, about Facebook? About Facebook, about Google, about, quite frankly, to some extent, Amazon and Apple as well. Each of them is trying to build a walled garden. And we, as a media operation, need to find ways to circumvent those walled gardens. That's what our clients pay us to do. And those, if you look at those four companies you mentioned, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, they're all basically products of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. Apple actually goes back to 76. But it's a different company. But the Apple, was. yeah, the, the Apple we're talking about started with the iPod. And, Correct. And Amazon goes a little before the 2000. So if those four companies have emerged in 15 years, there have to be another two or three that are on the, ver the cusp of emerging over the next I think so. Do you know, who, who do you think they might be? Who would you bet on I, as I, the fifth? I'd be, I would, it's nice to see Microsoft revived. Well, it is nice to see Microsoft revived. And by the way, uh, you know, this didn't come from me, but Steve Jobs, in one of his last public appearances, mm -hmm. talked about the four pillars of technology, right? When would this have been, Jeff? For, when did he, he pass He died away? in 11, so in it's 11. Been, So uh, probably was about 10. So five years ago, Steve Jobs stood up in front of a large group of people, referred to the four pillars of technology as Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google, and he left Microsoft off. Now, if we were having this conversation even 10 years ago, that would have been incomprehensible, right? Because 
Microsoft was the dominant player in the technology space. So it just shows that will that happen to Google? I don't think so. Will it happen to Apple? No, I don't think so. But it can happen to anyone. If it happened to Microsoft, and you're right, they are on their way back, but they're not back yet. And if you want to you know, you try to explain what happened to Microsoft, it's hard to explain, Steve Ballmer. Um, but it really, no, they no, see. No. I think you just no, I mean, hit the you, nail on the head. When you look at the first thing the new CEO does is he makes uh, Microsoft Office available for the iPad. Right. You realize it's a whole new company. That's right. So any, beyond Microsoft coming back, any companies right now that you think could get to the four pillars, make it a fifth pillar or a sixth? I think I'm almost certain that in the next five to 10 years, we will see a non-US based entity. Chinese? Could be Chinese, could be Indian, could be from anywhere. But we have had a disproportionate share. We've had a 100% share in the technology space. And I will bet you anything that in the next five years, we will see a foreign player come in and take a dominant position. But, um, so going back to the science, let's talk a little bit about programmatic and how you're set up. Zaxis is one of the sponsors of this pro conference. What, talk a little bit about your strategy. But Zaxis isn't technically a programmatic play. It, it happens to be highly programmatic. Zaxis is a product, right? Um, we, we use Group M Connect uh, for programmatic activity, but it's really hard for me to even talk about programmatic because everybody defines programmatic differently, right? I'm not inclined to quote Marissa Myers very often, but she is the one who said the opposite of programmatic is manual, right? If one were to go for the moment with that definition, then I would suggest that, I mean, for example, television became highly systemic by the mid-90s when reach and frequency optimization was done 100% by computers, when brand allocations were almost entirely done systemically, None of it was real time, but I don't think anyone should confuse real time with programmatic, right? To me, programmatic is what you have to do when the granularity of data exceeds the, a human's ability to process the sheer volume. Not the insights that derive from it, but the sheer volume of data can no longer be processed any other way. And with all this data that you, that Facebook, with Google are collecting, do you think we're going to hit the wall on the privacy issue and a rebellion from consumers? Or do you think we will continue to collect data irrespective of privacy concerns? I think it will remain a political hot potato. The European Union certainly yes, seems indeed. to have hit the wall. Yes, indeed. But can anyone in this room give me an example of a single individual who was hurt by a privacy violation or whose life was negatively impacted by the fact that a marketer knew some intimate details of their lives, albeit in an anonymized fashion. Anybody? Anyone? Right? I mean, we know that drunk driving is bad. We know that texting while driving is bad. But having someone collect cookies on you, how does that hurt anyone? By the way, I, get, I don't delete my cookies. I'm an avid photographer. I get an awful lot of ads on my iPad uh, uh, related to cameras, related to audio stuff, right? I'd much rather get that than ads for lipstick, which these days, I don't use very much. But in your time. <laughs> uh, yeah. and it, so I, I, 
I really so think. Consumers I, don't just I, viscerally I, respond, though, to the sense that you have this stuff, even though you're arguing we can't prove real damage, and clearly in this room we don't see any. No, you don't. Um, I mean, by the way, when, we, when the foray sent a delegation to Washington, <clears throat> that was precisely the question that was asked of the uh, politicians, who some of them understood it intellectually, but still wanted a political hot potato to play with because they didn't have much else to play with. But I think, look, we have to take the privacy issues very, very seriously. We have to police ourselves. We cannot afford to screw this up. An organization like Group M has privacy compliance officers. Um, we do have PII inside of WPP. We keep it absolutely firewalled from both Cantor and from Group M. Only anonymized data assets can pass through that wall. You have to do that kind of stuff. I mean, one of the things we see in our work is people talk about how concerned they are about their privacy, but how quickly and cheaply they surrender it if they think there's potential Yeah, I also, think, I also think we've never really had any privacy. In 1987, I had a very close colleague who she worked with me. She insisted. By the way, those were the days before mobile phones, for those of you who are too young to remember such a thing. Um, she refused to give us an itinerary when she went on vacation. And the quid pro quo was that she would call in twice a day. So we didn't know where she had taken off to. And she was on her vacation for two, three days. Nobody had any idea where she was. She was calling in twice a day. Her sister calls up and says her mom had had a massive heart attack unlikely to make it. Where's her sister? It took us 20 minutes to find her, OK? Through credit card records that were pretty easy to access. By the way, it would have taken seven minutes if she had booked into a hotel and used her credit card. But she rented a villa, and she paid by check. And that's why it took an extra 13 minutes. But 1987. We were able to find her in under 20 minutes. No, you're right. If, you, if right. you really believe in privacy, you shouldn't have a credit card or a checking account and try renting a car or a hotel room without one. Right. Um, well, you do, you, know, you do what Osama bin Laden did for a long time. You live in a cave, and you don't use a cell phone. Moving a little bit, going beyond pri um, privacy into ad blocking. First, is this a real threat? ad blocking. I mean, we certainly have had remote controls and scanning and ways to avoid ads to a small degree. Well, we've always had ad skipping technology, right? Starting, we didn't start with TiVo. We started with the VCR, and I'm sure there were iterations even before that. But um, ad blocking technology has always been a part of, of our equation. Having said that, I fundamentally believe that the consumer doesn't consume media with the objective of avoiding ads. I mean, if you look at the way the typical reader goes through a Condé Nast publication, they actually spend more time on the ads than they do on the editorial content, right? I know when I go through popular photography or stereophile or the absolute sound, which I, I read every one of those, by the way, not one of them on paper, all of them digitally, but I read every one of them, I guarantee you I spend more time on the ads than I do on the editorial. Right? So I don't think that's what drives consumers. I also think that most consumers understand that um, that we don't have a constitutional right to free content just because we want it, right? That's not one of our inalienable rights. And they understand that there is a bargain that has sort of been struck. You get your content, you look at the ads. By the way, the most modern iteration of that is the fastest growing delayed viewing 
uh, category today is VOD, right? Um, in VOD, most VOD deployments of, um, in the last few years do not allow ad skipping. And the consumer accepts it. They get a service. They get to watch it conveniently without having to record it. They don't have to do anything anticipatory. It's there for them when they're ready. And they can't skip the ads. They still watch the content. It's not that complicated, and the consumer isn't that stupid. So I think. So do that doesn't keep you awake. It does not. It, look, do I wake up for two seconds in the middle of the night before I roll over and fall fast asleep again? Yes. But it doesn't keep me awake for long. And but then you know the line. They say the innocent and the dim-witted sleep soundly. And, and, and we've, we've established I'm not innocent. Mm -hmm. And we were talking at breakfast. I think consumers get there's only three ways to get content, steal it, and they know that's not a good business model, pay subscriptions or fees, or advertising. And I think they clearly right. prefer advertising I think in so. most instances. I think we're, we're going to see some interesting hybrids uh, between paid and advertising supported. I mean, as an example, the Hulu experiment that's going on now. I'm not sure they'd appreciate my referring to it as an experiment, but. And, and I, we were talking yesterday, Hulu's struggling to figure out exactly who it is, and that's an interesting part of that. Um, on a broader level, we, we, we've talked before, Walter Isaacson, in his biography of Steve Jobs, said that a month before Jobs passed away, he called Isaacson up with this fascinating comment I finally cracked television. And of course, what everybody was hoping was maybe there would be an Apple-branded television set. Maybe there would be a whole different way of interacting with television. And until the recent Apple TV, they haven't done much of anything. What do you think it means to crack television? And will anybody do that? I'm sure they will. I don't know who it'll be, but I think it's a broader issue. I think the whole area of user interface is a massive, massive opportunity. I mean, if you think about it, Google, Google search as a user interface has changed almost not at all since the early days. Yes, they've got a bar across the top that lets you pull news and lets you pull images and on and on and on, but the fundamental interface itself hasn't changed significantly. The Facebook inter, uh, inter, user interface has not changed significantly. And neither has the television one. Yes, we've gone from an electronic uh, channel guide to something more sophisticated. But I think there are enormous opportunities there, and someone will crack it. And I think the best example of a user interface shift is the iPad, right? We never contemplated the functionality that we have on the iPad before it arrived. Someone will do that to television. A computer that doesn't take three minutes to boot. You don't have to, if you log off, you don't have to have a debate with yourself. And, Is it important enough to go back? Well, and, and the television is still clunky. My two-year-old granddaughter walks up to the TV and goes like this, trying to change channels. She doesn't understand why she needs a remote. And by the way, she's right. She's absolutely right. Um, and uh, before we get to one last topic, click fraud. Is that a problem for all the data and science it's you're collecting? It's a huge problem. It's a huge problem because it, it strikes at the integrity of our entire marketplace. And it should, we shouldn't have it. We shouldn't encourage it. We shouldn't be buying clicks that we know are fraudulent. And on the publisher side, by the way, this is one of those cases where one needs to follow the money. And uh, anyone who is benefiting either directly or indirectly from click fraud, well, shame on you. I shouldn't be looking at you because I know you don't. But it's, oh, I'm a good it's, it, it, it is a case of following the money. And, you know, I, and what's I'm it? really, really annoyed at the IAB for the bullshit that they have for both viewability standards and for, uh, for fraud. And 
as you know, we set up our own viewability and uh, fraud standards, and we have quite a list of preferred partners who have aligned with us on our own standards, and I'm hoping that everybody will follow suit with at least as tough a set of standards as we have. So it sounds like click fraud gets another couple seconds beyond ad blocking in the middle of the night. You worry a little more, what, that it'll taint all the, uh, the integrity of all? I think it already what? has tainted the integrity of the entire market. And uh, yeah, it gets more than a few seconds in the middle of the night because all we can do is put up a net. It is a space race. The bad guys are going to figure out ways to get fraud past us just as we come up with solutions to block it, right? And so I worry whether we are blocking 99% of the fraud or only 85% of the fraud. And I think there are going to be some fluctuations. And anything else keeping you awake for a couple minutes during the night? Anything else on your mind these days? Too dim-witted and not innocent enough. Um, yeah, dim-witted is an so, adjective I always hear about you. Yeah. So I think, it, it not, not so much keeping me up at night, um, but And then I'm going to ask what you're some, most excited about. Well, let me connect the two. Right. And, and answer both questions in one shot. So on the one hand, I worry about the turmoil that our business is in, right? We're going through circa $27 billion in reviews as we speak. That kind of turmoil cannot be healthy for the business. It's disruptive, it, it uh, re-diverts our strongest talent to projects that don't necessarily serve the best interests of our existing client base. Um, it is massively expensive. It lends to significant increases in overhead costs, all of those things. I think I worry about the fact that clients have become very, very short-term in their perspectives. Uh, a number of our clients over the last few years have had activist shareholders come on their boards, and the ones that haven't are constantly looking over their shoulders. It's the short-term quarterly result that dictates things as opposed to the long-term. And decisions that are made in that context are often foolish from a long-term perspective. I think everybody understands that. So we've got that on the downside. On the upside, I see the role of media changing fundamentally. I mean, you know, you, we talked about what happened between 1950 and 1995, right? And you're absolutely right. There's been more change in the last 10 years than there has been in the 50 years before that. By the way, for the absence of doubt, I didn't enter the business until the 70s in 1950. I was a year old and still in China, uh, where, there was, where there was a communist revolution going on and there weren't a lot of media agencies to go work for. 1949 was a pretty eventful year to be in China, even though you were a, a baby. What a, yeah. that it was wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault, I was too little. And anything else excites you? Well, what excites me is that the one thing that I would, that, well, there are two things that I'll point to. The first is that the significantly increased granularity of data just in the last few years allows us to completely change what the media practice is about. If we were having this conversation 15 years ago, we would very quickly agree that the role of media was to create awareness and to mitigate its decay. That's all we did, right? Today, the granularity of data allows us to deal with not just the top of the marketing funnel, and to your comment earlier, 
yes, the shape of the funnel is fundamentally changing, and it's not a linear path. It is much more of an iterative path. But today, the role of media is to a, you continue to serve the top of the marketing funnel, which is build awareness. If you reduce your effort at maintaining awareness, you lose market share. That's been proven time and time and time again. But in addition to that, the role of media today is to identify consideration and act on it, to turn consideration into preference, and to turn preference into a transaction. And there is sufficient data out there to do that quite effectively. So that's number one. Number two, you know, in 1999, a small group of us sat down and wrote a deck that talked about the convergence of media data and technology, right? In 2007, when we updated the deck, we referred to that convergence in the past tense. But what we did say is there's a fourth vector heading into convergence, and that's distribution. Now, for digital goods and services, that convergence is behind us as well. But in the last seven years, we've seen a category like disposable diapers move from 100% brick and mortar sales to just under 25% today. And if physical shelf space starts to disappear or become less relevant, then media becomes virtual shelf space. It becomes part of the distribution process. And I would suggest that whatever the value was for media as an awareness creator, that value will be a multiple of that because media as shelf space, as a transaction creator, as part of the distribution process, is a far more powerful proposition. And I think that's a really shiny future. I didn't interrupt a moment of the last three minutes because I thought you were just powerfully stating value proposition and what we're seeing today, which is really I what just you made did. it all up. Well, you did it, you did it well. So let's take some questions from the audience. If I, I think people should stand and introduce themselves, and please keep it succinct, and let's try to get as many questions in the question and answer time we have. And I will... By the up. way, I didn't suddenly get taller than you, but when you weren't looking, I jacked my seat up. <laughs> Hi, uh, Sarah Robertson, Horizon Media. I had a question about privacy. And um, the question you asked about whether anyone has ever been hurt by having um, a privacy violation. And it reminded me of a story that's kind of related. It's not exactly privacy, but it might be more about um, controlling your data. Um, there was a story, I think, a few months back where there was a family whose daughter was killed in a car accident. And it was you know, a terrible accident, um, really graphic. And video footage was collected of it and leaked. The and Nick it went Katsouris case. Yeah. Yeah, and it went online and, and you know, every time someone searched their family or went onto Google and tried to find them or the family, they got these horrific videos of the car accident. And you know, maybe that's less about privacy, but maybe it's more about um, controlling your own data. Is that something, if not privacy, should we be concerned about how we control our own data and how we control our stories? The only thing I would just add to that was those pictures became available because the police who photographed the accident scene started sharing them. Um, yep, viral. Well, that's why God created Chatham House rules, right? Um, but you're abs you, you touch on a critical thing, and it's, it's a general statement about the state of affairs on the web today and the fact that once something is out there, you can't take it back. I think, I think that governments and politicians need to deal with that because so far on the privacy side, there have been very, very few issues. I don't want to make any suggestions to the wrong people, and I hope nobody repeats what I'm about to say, but is it possible that somebody will one day hack into Google's data structure and come up with personally identifiable insights? Yeah, maybe. I hope it doesn't happen. 
but I think those of us on that side of the business have been very, very responsible. I mean, I'll give you one little example. We have Z plus four data, right? We have algorithmic processes that ensure that if somebody in a low income Z plus four buys a Maserati, and we have the PII on that, that we don't use that to connect the dots to all the other behavior characteristics we have. That's just being responsible. There are, there are data characteristics that allow us to pin an event or an occasion to one individual. We just don't do it. It's just a matter of good practice. I think we all have to police ourselves. I think we all have to have compliance in place. And I think we have to be, we have to take responsibility for how we behave so that someone doesn't impose rules on us. I'm going to suppress any natural desire to comment so we can get more questions. And uh, over yeah. there. Andy Russell from Inside Hook. <clears throat> Curious, over the past 16 months, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram uh, have all put live video stream. Uh, into the into our streams. Uh, if you have a database of a tight cohort of email or PII information, you can actually target lookalike audiences quite well and create branded content, maybe even better than <clears throat> television with reach uh, and accountability, measurability. Uh, what do you think the impact of that on television is? as we are each carrying a television and a video camera in our hands, and we can all amplify that type of content out to our friends. Okay, so just a general comment, um, and then I'm going to point you to a blog that my colleague Rob Norman wrote just a few weeks ago. Um, you, can't, you can't do an apples to apples comparison between television audiences and the numbers that keep getting quoted by the Snapchats and the Instagrams and the Facebooks and everything else. Because a two second view in no way, shape or manner equates to an average audience as defined on the television side, right? And um, if anybody, you know what? I'll get the organizers a link to Rob's blog. It's really good reading. Go through it, it'll explain the whole thing. And, and a good blog just to read in general. Yeah. Smart. Uh, other questions? We still have a couple minutes if there are any other questions. I have a question. I just want, over there in the very. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Ashwin from Samba TV. Um, Erwin, you'd mentioned that um, you don't like to rely entirely on data uh, provided by your vendor. Yeah. Um, I was curious if you could speak to uh, data provided by your clients. And also, you know, how you harmonize the demand, the interests, the sophistication of your clients and wanting to have their own data. How have you been able to harmonize uh, those, those competing demands? Okay. So, uh, two fundamental thoughts, and then I'll get into the details. Um, thought number one is, there's a basic conflict of interest that comes when data is vendor supplied. They have an interest in making it look as good as they possibly can make it look. And so one should never take it in that form. Number two, we need to know something about an impression or a profile that the vendor doesn't know about. Because otherwise, the data is used to maximize either the publisher's or the, the vendor's yield, while we get paid to minimize a client's cost. Right? So that's two broad thoughts. Um, as it relates to the value of client data, some of it is incredibly valuable, some of it is incredibly low value. In either case, data's true value comes from it being conjoined to other behavioral characteristics. If I know that somebody surfed to one of my client's beauty care sites, that only gives me a very, very small glimmer. If I know what television shows that person watches, 
and what their shopper behavior has been, that gives me a much more intricate understanding of that profile, right? Um, and I think generally speaking, we have clients who are, you know, if you have a client who's in the financial business, if you have a client, Netflix is a client of ours, these people know data as well as anyone. But if your primary business is manufacturing CPG products, your data structures probably don't have as much value as you might think they do, and certainly not as much as they would if they were properly conjoined to a massive number of other behavior characteristics. Does that help? Curious if you could comment on the demands of your clients to hold data themselves, and then how have you been able to harmonize uh, that, the, the demands you have on data with that, those of your clients? That's quite straightforward because, you know, client's first party data remains the property of the client. Once it's conjoined, the derivative data is shared in some fashion. But uh, as I said, in most cases, there is a real limit to the value of client first party data prior to conjoinment. It's the derivative data that has the true value. Right. Time for one, time for one more. Hi, uh, Carrie Lubis. Um, a quick question. How do we address the fact that Netflix, Amazon Prime, and all of these things that are emerging are taking audience away from advertised-based products? And as I work for an independent movie studio. You know, those people are frequent moviegoers, and we're not able to get them. And you know, there's a recent article that for kids, and I have a kids movie coming out, top two things that they use online are YouTube and Netflix. So how do you see addressing these places? And do you think that like a Netflix that's struggling to get more subscribers will eventually take advertising? So we already, I already said I, <clears throat> I believe there will be hybrid models, okay? Um, but by the way, we've been talking hybrid models for decades. Um, Jeff and I were talking the other day about a project that we did for Showtime in like 1982 about doing a hybrid advertiser-supported pay model. So it's been around for a while, and it will happen. But I think the larger question is that, you know, if this was a room full of television executives, my response would be that we have, that they had successfully sown the seeds of their own destruction by handing their content over to Netflix. Not only did they sow the seeds, but they water them regularly, okay? And line. I, think, I think the net of it is that by contributing their content to services like Netflix, they began to change computer, uh, computer, consumer behavior. And once you change consumer behavior, you can't force it to come back. So these things are here to stay. Having said all that, we do have to recognize that you know, even in prime time, Netflix consumption is a fraction of 1% of the households in the US. By the way, that fraction of 1% of the households at any given point in time in prime time is sucking up somewhere close to 35% of all the bandwidth in the country, right? If that number doubled, it would bring down our entire fiber infrastructure. So there, there are limits, and there are limits to how quickly those trends can develop, because the, the bandwidth uh, constraints just won't allow it to happen. But consumer behavior is changing. The concept of linear television is far less interesting than it was only five years ago. And those are changes that are irreversible. And I'm not sure they're really good for the television business. They're probably not. But I'm certain that the television business can adapt. And 
whether we continue to call it TV or a combination of web video and TV and over the top and everything else, it all converges into one family of product. Notice the name of this conference, Videonomics, right? Uh, when that convergence is complete, I think it'll serve the consumer quite well. Still fun to go to work in the morning? If it wasn't, I wouldn't have to, would I? I don't think so. But then, no, that's inspiring to us. That it's still fun to go to work in the morning. Erwin, thank you for taking the time, for coming up. Pleasure. I